My name is Ethan Dix, and this is a look at some of the computers from the first five years of the 6502. By the mid-1970s, there were already several 8-bit microprocessors available, the 8080, the Z80, and the 6800 at the head of the class. Chuck Peddle was part of the team at Motorola who developed the 6800, which sold for $300 in 1974. He wanted to produce a much cheaper processor to encourage widespread adoption, so he and several teammates left Motorola to found Moss Technologies, which created the 6502. The initial price was an insanely low $25, one-tenth of the competition. At those prices, by 1976, several companies were developing home computers around it, Apple and Commodore being two of the best known. With only a few minutes, I can't cover each and every home computer with the 6502 in it, but I can show off a few I have handy. Let's have a look. This is the Sim 1, a Kim 1 clone from 1978, made by Synertech, a second source company for the 6502 and some of the I.O. chips. It comes with 4K of RAM and a monitor program in ROM with room for ROM upgrades like BASIC and a resident assembler. It has the BASIC Kim 1 I.O. connectors across the top, plus a couple of additional connectors, including a built-in serial interface with both 20 milliamp current loop and RS-232 drivers. The monitor program lets you inspect and change memory, inspect and change CPU registers, save and load to paper tape and audio cassette, and execute code in RAM or ROM. Using either the built-in keypad or a dumb terminal, you can enter a program into the SIM1 and execute it. This is the Rockwell AIM-65, a single board computer from 1978. It's an enhanced Kim-1 clone with the same connectors for memory and I.O. expansion, but instead of a calculator keyboard and 7-segment LEDs, it has a 20-character ASCII LED display and a full keyboard. It also usually shipped with a small thermal printer. The AIM-65 came standard with 1K of RAM, internally expandable to 4K, a monitor ROM, and three open ROM sockets. There are several firmware options, the most common two being ROM Basic or a Resident Assembler program. This particular AIM-65 has been upgraded with a third-party expansion, originally sold as a multi-IO board sitting on the application connector, this one here is a modern recreation of the primary function made by David Cole Glazier. It talks to a standard Commodore 64 floppy drive in much the same way a Commodore machine does. It can be used to load and save memory and read and write files from BASIC or the assembler. The included firmware lets you use the disk drive like any other device on the system. The Commodore VIC-20 came out in June 1980 and was touted the wonder computer of the 80s. It featured a color video and sound chip capable of displaying a screen of 23 by 22 characters in 8 colors with one voice sound. The base RAM was 5K, tiny at the time, but expandable to 32K. It was Commodore's first computer to use the new single drive model 1540 serial interface 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive. In addition to the peripheral interface, the VIC-20 came with a user port that could also be used as a serial interface with either an RS-232 cartridge or the low-cost VIC modem, shown here. It's also the first Commodore computer to support a joystick paddle port compatible with Atari 2600 controllers. Most programs of the VIC-20 came on cassette or ROM cartridges, but some did come on floppy disk. Less than a year after the VIC-20 debuted, the Commodore 64 was announced, and even though the VIC-20 is credited with being the first million-selling computer, it was quickly eclipsed by the vastly more capable Commodore 64. Still, in early 1980, the VIC-20 was a taste of what was to follow.
This is the Commodore PET from 1977. It was one of three major home computers that came out that year. It originally shipped with 4K of RAM, 8K optional, a 40 column monochrome screen, basic in ROM, a built-in tape drive, and one of the worst keyboards in history. There were two of these at the public library, and I would go down every Saturday to take my turn on one for an hour, writing games in basic and hooking up home-built devices to the user port in the back. This arcade keyboard add-on came from my own pet we got a couple years later. My brothers and I used to play a lot of Space Invaders, enough that we wore out three keys in the original keyboard. I made this from the shell of a Radio Shack 151 electronic experimenters kit and three genuine arcade buttons I bought from the local arcade supplier. A quick demo of the Space Invader keys. The program is very basic. And after waiting for the cassette to load, here's Space Invaders. Well, that's a quick look at a few of the machines from the first five years of the 6502. There are many more, from Apple, Atari, and Ohio Scientific, to name a few. We've barely scratched the surface here. For those interested in comparing the features and capacities of the computers shown here, there's a list at the end, including memory sizes and I.O. capabilities. I'm looking forward to the next in-person VCF, where I plan to bring these out and maybe a couple of surprises as well. Hope to see you there.